Africa. And my guest today, as I get settled around this long conference table, is David Ansar from the Free Market Foundation. David, how's it going? How's it, Chris? Good to have you here at the FMF offices in Bryanston. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation. Um, I didn't know much about the Free Market Foundation. Um, so this is, I think, an opportunity for myself and for the viewers to learn a little bit about it. So it apparently has quite a long history. Indeed it does. It was started in the 1970s. Uh, That's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and as you know, that was the height of apartheid world. Part Maybe that was the beginning of the end of apartheid. And That's probably a fair statement after Soweto in 76, yeah. Correct, yeah. So the Free Market Foundation played quite a critical role in advocating for individual liberty during this time in which mm -hmm. freedom was dramatically constrained. Curtailed, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, and so, you know, that is a very important tradition. And really, I would say the FMF falls within the classical liberal tradition, uh, and that essentially involves promoting free market policies in terms of uh, economic policy. So your freedom to trade, your freedom to uh, earn an income uh, with uh, minimal state interference. Uh, if you look around the world, wherever you have secure private property rights, you have really the building blocks for a prosperous and free society. So uh, I think there are many very strong economic arguments for private property rights, but also moral arguments that that is part of your inherent dignity as an individual that you can lay claim to the property uh, that is yours and not have that. Gosh. Yes, not to be confused. Yeah, yeah that's draconian. Which, which is, law and order is important, but you want stability. But the rule of law is essentially speaking to the fairness and the, uh, the, of the legal system. So are all laws in society equally applicable to everyone, regardless mm. of your power or status? whether you're the president or... Or you're a, a, a blacksmith. Yeah. Uh, so, and there's obviously a distribution of power in society, but you want legal institutions to be treating everybody the same, uh, mm -hmm. according everyone the same rights and obligations and, and duties. So, so those three pillars really make up a big part of what we stand for. But what we do is research. Mm -hmm. We do media advocacy. So. And also increasingly engaging uh, in public interest litigation. So we have. I mentioned so would you, for instance, sorry to interrupt, sure. would you be interested in like trying to stop the new state of disaster, national disaster? Would that be something you'd engage in? Well, we actually had a legal committee meeting uh, on that on Friday. Oh, and okay. uh, politically, we think this is a calamitous policy. Wow. And I will not disagree. <laughs> <laughs> and it's an admission of failure by the state that their own highly centralized, uh, centrally... They created the mess, isn't it? It's nice to be the mm. king, isn't it? It's good to be the king. <laughs> I create the mess, and then I usurp more power by blaming on the mess. Mm. I mean, that's essentially what happened. So, so we are holding back on litigation on that particular point for the time being. You are, but others are going forward. I can attest to that. <laughs> yes, yeah, I've, I've noted that, definitely. But, uh, but we are... We are watching this very closely, and so in terms of the, the legislation, it might be premature to challenge that now, but it will depend on the regulations that are... That are promulgated. Yeah. So if you recall during COVID, there was the state of disaster, yes. but then there were... All, all these the, rules that came out. Yeah, restrictions. Tobacco. On, yeah. You, could, you couldn't wear open-toed shoes. What? Yeah. That was actually a rule. Uh, buying some warm chicken from Woolworths. Yeah. Was, was yeah. Uh, okay, we could spend hours talking about that <laughs> lunacy on, and what happened. But, uh, you know, you, you mentioned um, land tenure. And um, if you look at Peru, and you're probably familiar with this, mm. Peru had pervasive poverty and serious issues because people were basically serfs. They didn't own the land they worked on for the most part. But they went through a series of land tenure reform, and people got title grant to land that they occupied. And... Peru's poverty dropped dramatically as a consequence of that. And civic engagement increased dramatically when people became property owners uh, in places they've been living forever but just didn't own it because the, the system, the feudal mm -hmm. system was essentially there before. I think it was it Hernan not Hernando de Soto, the famous Spanish explorer, but a 20th century economist, Hernando de Soto, wrote about mm -hmm. this and a great success story. And every time I hear about land expropriation in South Africa, I'm like, why are you going the opposite direction? And you know, also the ANC was talking about putting a million farmers, putting a million people on farms. And the rest of the world is going to automation, reducing farm labor. It's just, it seems like a step backwards. And land tenure, I think, is uh, a big issue still here in South Africa, yes? Mm. Yeah, and De Soto wrote The Other Path and 
spoke very convincingly, I think, about the role that private property rights plays in economic development. So we at the Free Market Foundation have for many years now, since around 2010, run the Kaya Lung Project, okay. which is essentially means our home. Mm -hmm. And in, for various historical reasons, many black South Africans live on former council properties. Right. Uh, and sometimes for generations they've been on these properties, their families. But they have no tenure or no title to it. Yeah. And so they are uh, decent, honest, hardworking South Africans. They pay their rates often, but they just don't have any legal documentary evidence that they are the legitimate owners mm -hmm. of the properties in which they've resided. So what we, through the Kaya Lung Project, have done is facilitated the transfer of title deeds from the councils, from the municipalities, mm -hmm to those have you properties. had success with that well indeed we have we've had ten thousand well, see, see this, this ten thousand such transfers. how many of you know this i mean my viewers know that for years i've been talking about dead capital hmm. all this land that people live on like rdp houses the state still owns and controls it if they want to in reduce poverty and give people the opportunity of the future, why not transfer title of all those RDP houses to the occupants? Yes, I know some people will sell the house and they'll be foolish, but that isn't a justifiable reason for the state to hold on to it unless you want dependency on the state. And so my argument for a long time has been transfer that because it's dead capital. Billions of rand, hundreds of billions, maybe trillions of rand of dead capital because if you're ambitious, you want to start a small business, a tuck shop or a spas or something like that, if you own property, now you have collateral to go to a bank. Hmm. You're exactly. less of a risk. And they're just, they're, they're just keeping people in serfdom, in my view. Yeah, so you could use that collateral to start a business. Exactly. It's an economic Instead amplifier. of the Sasa grant. <laughs> yeah. And so I think very important with this is, and I think this is very pervasive in South Africa, people talk about the poor as this amorphous category yeah. of people. We must do something for the poor. But the poor are individual people who may, through whatever circumstance, not have had the same opportunities, mm -hmm. they don't have the same social capital or skills that others in the middle classes or the mm -hmm. elite have, but they still have agency, which we must respect. Yep. And so I think an, a feature of Kaya Lam is that we recognize that these are people that have rights. They, they have rights over their property. They, their home is very important to them. It is, it is their asset. And so we help we work with the municipalities, we work with uh, conveyances to legitimately transfer these, these properties. But something I'd also add is, it is an economic amplifier, but some of the beneficiaries of this program are in the 80s or 90s. And for oh, shame they had to wait so long. Yeah, and for decades, they have not had the legal recognition that they've- That must, must bring tears to their eyes to finally get it. Literally, you see the, the old man with his tears running down the wrinkles on his cheeks, you know, saying for the first time, I've had my property rights recognized. And, you know, so I think for us classical liberals, uh, you know, we kind of conceptually normally who benefit from this program, they're not going home at night and reading Ludwig von Mises. And, no, no, they're not. And Friedrich Hayek. <laughs> Friedrich Hayek, yeah. yeah that's, but they, the they served him is not on their reading list. Exactly. But they know fundamentally that they want to have a right to own their own property and absolutely their own and you know that 90 year old grandpa is probably not going to start his own business who knows he might oh but, but it's it's the right thing to do mm. it's the right moral and just thing to do and for women as well it's very important because often uh, consider a hypothetical case where a woman is married to a man who owns a property and he wants to uh, as part of his estate bestow that property on his wife when he dies when he does die Sometimes you might have uh, the family of, of, of trying the to claim deceased it. trying to claim it and she needs to be able to enforce that property right or she needs to go off and work in the fields or go and seek a job in another town or city and not have the fear that someone's going to move in and take her property away from her. So that's really critical and that for us is a, an expression of the importance of private property rights. It's not just an abstract notion. And, you know, I think in South Africa there's a big debate around, you know, we need to... Uh, can make amends for the injustices of the past, and definitely there were injustices, mm. many of which were the state seizing the government is proposing through expropriation without compensation. Absolutely, no. It's it's uh, and the, quite frankly, the moment the ANC proposed that amendment, they should have been removed from the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act. One of the key pillars of the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, which gives South African products and services duty-free entry into the U.S. market, 
is recognition and respect for property rights. And uh, I've been arguing that they should be removed. Of course, some South Africans wouldn't be happy about that, and I doubt it would get the ANC's attention, but frankly, that's what should be done. I mean, if you don't respect property rights, you're trying to undermine them, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have duty-free access to our marketplace. Yeah, and for the automotive manufacturers in South Africa, that would hurt. They, they rely on a go access to American markets. BMW parts come from South Africa, not from Germany for our BMWs, <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> so, yeah, that's absolutely true. You know, you mentioned something a short while ago, uh, David, that I think is very important people need to recognize. And, and this is why I find a confluence between classical liberals and I'm, I'm a center-right conservative. Um, not a classical conservative, so to speak, but uh, I find a, a confluence of the two thoughts here, and this is respect and dignity for the individual. You mentioned agency. One of the things I find most frustrating about the political environment here is the, I think, disrespect for citizens and, and the, the expectation that they lack agency, that someone needs to make decisions for them. It seems to be like the state is here to take care of people and that people lack agency. They can't function on their own. And I, I, I find that personally insulting. Is that something you come across or do you have a similar view or, or different? Yeah, I think a lot of this stems from the ANC's ideological mm -hmm. convictions of, which is informed by the, this idea of the National Democratic Revolution. And essentially, this is a Marxist-Leninist uh, policy framework or uh, ideology that, that sees the ANC as the self-appointed vanguard of the revolution. That these are enlightened people who know what's best for the people of South Africa. If only. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they are the, uh, the vanguard. So they are at the front lines pushing back against... Uh, the embedded interests of white monopoly capital or, or whatever it might or be. Or big mining interest or big bank or whatever the case is. And yeah. this, this philosophy is fundamentally paternalistic. Um, That's, yes, indeed. Yeah, and it, uh, it again, to my earlier point, it, it sees the working classes or the poor as not individuals with agency or aspirations or their own uh, kind of complex, uh, uh, you know, life circumstances, but as... An amorphous blob. Yeah, and pawns on a chessboard to, to move around to achieve your ends of power, right? So I think that uh, that has created, ironically, a, a lot of the degradation and the mess that we see in South Africa today because, for example, the policy of cadre deployment is very much based on this notion that there is no separation between party and state. The party is the state because the party is the will of the people. And so uh, that's why... the the ANC has uh, no concern about deploying its cadres to ESCOM and then it's a very short leap to make to say, well, we need to extract the resources from the Hitachi deal uh, and channel that or to the Chancellor. Or direct 30% of uh, Starlink's uh, shares to a mm. BEE enterprise, yeah, which is why you don't have Starlink. And uh, I think you mentioned that you had spoken with Ans van Sale at Afroforum. Yes. And the other day he was on television and I thought he made a very apt observation, which is that there is no BEE in South Africa. There's only CEE, which is cadre economic empowerment. That's the bottom line. And yes. I think we need to get around this idea. I think there are many people in South Africa, most of them black, who have been excluded from the economy. Absolutely. And uh, whose private property rights have been disrespected and who uh, are often uh, on the receiving end of abuse of state power. You know, so if you think of the street vendor, the old Google who's selling Fepcook, mm -hmm. who has her table confiscated and her goods removed. Uh, you know, the reason she has a door as a table is because uh, she doesn't want to invest in an expensive table because the metro They're is trash. Her, and, yeah, and trash. Or, or the people who move on to city land in Joburg mm -hmm. and they pull out the red ants to beat them up, rob them, and clear it out while the police stand by and watch it. No, absolutely. A lot of black South Africans have been abused by the state in the past 30 years, and it's often overlooked by the press because it doesn't fit the narrative that they want to talk about. No, I think it's a very important point to talk about. And, you know, an interesting thing has happened in six months since I was last here. Last time here, I speak to anybody. I speak to petrol station attendants. I speak mm. to people, clerks or clerks, you know, as they like to say in stores. Uh, we say clerks. And uh, things. I talk to anybody. Uh, people who clean rooms, people who work in restaurants. And I noticed a very distinct change from six months ago, which I haven't seen over the past 20 years in South Africa. In the past, people have been angry at times about service delivery, about failures. But the last year with ESCOM and power failures and, and, and some people without power three, four, five days in a row, has really pushed this to a tipping point, mm -hmm. I think. Almost every black South African, whether they've been Zulu, Kosa, um, Ndebele, Tswana, that I've met on this trip, is angry 
And maybe they were angry last time, but this time they're angry at the ANC. And I think that's a distinct difference. I don't know how that's going to pan out in 2024, but um, I think that's a very big development. And the ANC seems to be oblivious to it. They're just whistling past the cemetery. They have no idea that they're not popular. Well, I think they are aware of the declining popularity. Oh, declining popularity. But their inability to respond to that is... No, because they're fossilized. They're ossified in, mm. in the way they approach things. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of disarray within the ranks of the ANC. And, Fair point. You know, I think there is this overarching ideology, but there's also rampant factionalism, corruption. Uh, there's jostling for power within the alliance. Um, and so that means there's a very complex game that is being played. Uh, I think what's very interesting about the, the ESCOM crisis, though, is we are big advocates uh, of something which is not very popular in South Africa, which is the P word. Privatization. Yes, exactly. Well, that's what I've been arguing for for over 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> and privatization is happening by default now. Yes, because people are moving off grid. They're getting their, either themselves or getting it from someone else. Yeah, so not only are individuals putting a solar panel on their but roof. But companies too. Yeah, companies. But there is this very belated and reluctant concession by the government that they are unable to keep the lights on. To, pro to provide the core fundamentals of an industrial economy, which is regular dispatchable electricity. Well, uh, the bottom line, and this is what's frustrating for Africa, because you know I cover all the continent, 624 million people in this continent have no access whatsoever to electric generation. No mm -hmm. generators, no power whatsoever. So they rely on charcoal and things like that. But the real reality is in the 21st century, with the Industrial Revolution, now with the information age, the fourth generation, or fourth Industrial Revolution, you have to have safe, reliable, and affordable electricity. Without that, you can't have modern life. Mm. You just, just can't. I mean, th this trip, uh, <laughs> last trip was inconvenient and annoying, but this trip has been off the charts. I mean, I've lost so much productiv productivity. I haven't had time to do any writing because every time I try to write, there's load shedding. And my battery's low on my laptop because I already drained it for the last load shedding, mm. and I'm traveling between mm -hmm. places. My power banks can only power my phone so many times. And, you know, that's, it's, that's, that's uh, first world problems in the third world setting. But just take that and apply it to spoiled medication, spoiled food, abattoirs that can't process uh, meat and poultry products, and the list runs across transportation failures, incubators, uh, the list is endless. And the, the loss of productivity in this economy has to be a major drag. Absolutely. And if you consider the energy demands of an industrial smelter, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not going to power that with windmills and solar panels. <laughs> and, 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 and solar yeah. panels, yeah. <laughs> so we need base load capacity in South Africa. And we're very fortunate in that we sit on one of the world's largest deposits of coal. Uh, and I'm not fundamentally opposed to if somebody wants to, uh, on risk, build a solar power plant. Um, but there's some serious challenges there, right? Transmission is a challenge. We, we have, Storage we have is a, a challenge. We have a grid with, which was built to transmit energy from the coal-fired stations in Mpumalanga down throughout the kind of industrial east and center of the country. And Kuburg takes care of a lot of Cape the Western Cape, yeah. Um, but getting the, all that abundant solar energy from the Northern Cape to the rest of the country is very difficult. That's going to require a lot more storage capacity. Um, so the storage technology hasn't caught up. So, you know, I'm saying to, to people, well, there's the world that we would like to live in, mm. uh, this kind of solar punk dreamscape, uh, or there's the world we actually live in where we need power now. And, uh, you know, so I would say fixing some of the problems in the coal sector and also reinvesting in nuclear. I mean, that's nuclear is a, a long-term play. But small modular reactors mm -hmm. would be a, actually a rather quick solution. It would bring a lot of uh, small 10 megawatt power plants uh, pretty quickly, mm -hmm. but uh, no one seems to be interested in it. Yeah, another big contentious issue is regulation. So mm. the National Energy Regulator of South Africa, NERSA, who <coughs> just approved a 16% increase in the rates for ESCOM and 12% for next year. Yeah, it was six. It was 18.65%. Oh, sorry, 18.65, yeah. that's correct, yes. So now, do you know how they came up with that figure, Chris? Uh, it was half of what was asked. Yeah, so 32% was what was oh, asked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you put all that together, that's 650% more than you were paying a decade ago mm. for electricity. However, I would argue that for many years, it was underpaying. has been underpriced. Fair point, fair yeah. point. 
But, you know, we can speculate as much as we like. But the market forces have a way of determining what price is. That's what prices are. The signal of underlying value, mm -hmm. right? So there is an objective cost of producing electricity. Oh, absolutely. You have to be able to produce it for a profit, whether it's state-owned or not, so you have capital to reinvest and maintain and operate. And yeah, you are correct. I, I, I don't know the figure, but I'm pretty certain that that electricity was being sold at below cost for a long time here in South Africa, and it's been catching up with the market. I don't know if it's at or ahead of the market now if you look at what actually costs to produce power here. Mm. And I think it's going to be hard to get the actual figure because of all the phantom costs with all the efforts at load shedding and, and trying to repair facilities all the time. It's embarrassing that you know they had 24 Point seven five megawatts of generation capacity offline. Yeah, this is just insane. But insane. the point that I'm trying to yeah. make is, when you have these regulators and the utility getting together on a regular basis and determining what the price is, it's ultimately it's a it's a political negotiation. Mm. It's not really a reflection of the true price of electricity. No, no, it's just like yeah. the petrol price in this country. The government sets the price. That's not a market price. Mm. So when you see 18.65 there's a sort of false precision to that why isn't it 18.75 or 18.45 uh, you know so my point is that we need to actually free up the energy price and we need a floating energy price so that market participants can actually know mm -hmm. what the true value of electricity is and politically that's going to be quite a challenge to do because what will happen inevitably is if you float the electricity price, you might see a spike in the cost of energy. Of course, because yeah. the true cost will come out. Uh, but that will also be a signal to potential suppliers of electricity, hey, there's money to be made To here. be made, Yeah, especially if you allow privatization. <laughs> and then that will lead to a flood of new supply. A competition, which will eventually lead to lower prices and a balanced Yeah, so, so what would be great is if we had something like what they have in the UK, where there's a competition over not only generation, but distribution? And, but distribution as well. And yeah, so the trans, even the transmission grids uh, are privately run there. So, you know, I think that we need to get creative. We need to move away from the current paradigm. There are many commentators who say, well, we used to have a state-run utility that worked just fine. Mm -hmm. uh, I would actually argue, no, I think there's always been these inefficiencies. It's just been magnified so much by a lot of the corruption, the uh, wholesale uh, I would agree with that. Uh, theft yeah. and so on that's, that's been happening as well. But it, it's baked into the system. So uh, Andrew DeRate is on his way out. Uh, he was a very capable man, very technically qualified. Sabotaged at every angle. But I argued recently in an op-ed that even if you took Elon Musk and made him the CEO. You couldn't save it, ESCOM. ESCOM. You couldn't because the political uh, incentives that surround ESCOM are the real problem. It's not a lack of business acumen or technical expertise no. of which Musk has abundant. Uh, he ha has that in abundance. So I would venture that Musk would be more likely to take a manned mission to Mars than he would be to save ESCOM in its kind. Yeah, no, I would agree with you. Uh, the thing with uh, De Ryder taking the job was it was a fool's errand. Um, he was, he was, I think, set up to fail. There's no way he could save it. it it's, but I will say this: that uh, in my analysis, I'm pretty confident that the reason the grid didn't collapse in the past year is because of his interventions trying to keep things going at that company. Without De Ryder, who's become the pinata for so many people to blame for things. Mm. Your, net, your grid probably would have collapsed a year ago, and that would be catastrophic. If people think about the grid collapsing, they don't want to think about, it. okay, it'll come back on. It doesn't work that way. When the grid goes down, if the whole thing shuts down, you can't just turn it all back on at once. You have to do piece by piece by piece by power generation plant by power generation mm -hmm. plant. It's not th six hours, six days. could be six weeks. could be six months in some cases. And the devastation and carnage is a consequence of that. Simple things like pedestrians being struck by cars because there's no cross light or the robots aren't working. It's It's... It's devastating. Let's hope it doesn't get to that point. David, you've been very generous with your time, and uh, I think we've, we've kept you for a bit longer than probably anticipated, so thank you for that. But uh, I, we talk for hours. That's that. I know, I know when we have, to, we have to wrap up. But I did want to give a chance for you to make a pitch to the audience here quick, because I would, would you call it the K, what was the program? The Kyalam. The Kyalam. I bet you most of my viewers never heard of that, um, and they're South Africans, many of my viewers. I didn't know it, and it's right, it dovetails perfectly with my, my view on how you transfer property. But can you just make a pitch and let people know a little bit more that they should know about the Free Market Foundation? Well, look, we are fighting the good fight here. And I think South Africa for many years has been fancy. You know, if you think of uh, when Mr. Ramaphosa came to power, the, the assumption that a lot of business people made was, well, we need to reform the ANC. We need a reformer. This man is our, our last great hope. And 
what materialized was a failure of, of, of those expectations. Um, we fell well short of that. So I, I think it is now time, and we're seeing all of the symptoms of state decay and political abuse of our state institutions everywhere. Mm -hmm. We need to control away from the politicians. So we're not just an economic policy think tank. We're not just analyzing, oh, what's, what have they done in the rest of the world? What did they do in Chile? What did they do in Vietnam or Ethiopia? And what can we apply? Here? Good examples, though. Some great, great lessons to be yeah, learned. Yeah. But ultimately, the policy debate is informed by politics. Mm -hmm. It's not just a technocratic exercise. So we need to remove as much political power from the hands of politicians as possible and give that back to individuals in South Africa. So on the one hand, we need political transition, political change. So I'm greatly encouraged by the much more competitive political landscape in South Africa. Uh, we're seeing new emergent opposition parties. It's all a bit chaotic and, uh, and anarchic at the moment. It's a little messy, that's true. But, you know, this is part of the teething pains of a democracy or the maturation of a democracy. Maybe this is the kind of rebellious adolescence of our democracy. Yeah, these, these are not quite the teen years. It's the tween years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so there's that. But then also just generally we need to empower businesses. We need to empower individuals and families uh, to, to have a bit more say. Um, you know, democracy is not just about elections every five years. No, and, it's and a 365-day-a-year affair. And just outsourcing these very important matters to politicians who are operating on a five-year election cycle with very short-term interests, sometimes not the most uh, well-intentioned people. Um, and so when we say things like privatization, we're not just saying, well, give it to all the rich capitalists, uh, take this, the family silverware and, and sell it off to the rich capitalists. Like the Russians did. We're talking about <laughs> there is massive potential opportunity for entrepreneurs in this country to, to really provide solutions that, that people will value, right? So uh, when you woke up this morning at your bed and breakfast, uh, you, you probably used soap uh, when you went uh, to, I did. to bathe yourself. Did the government give you the soap? No. Nope. Uh, but... You saw personal hygiene as a very important thing. Yes. So, you know, uh, you buy the soap on, on the market and you, you, you bathe yourself, right? So, and I make a choice. I look for the best value and the best quality yeah. I can get. And if somebody wants to try and sell you a thousand rand soap, you're probably going to think, okay, well, that's a bit beyond my budget. That's no, probably not worth that much. <laughs> <laughs> so electricity actually is not really any different. And you can make the same case for other so-called essential uh, services or strategic Water. assets. Yeah. So uh, that's what I mean when we talk about privatization. So to your point, we are articulating these arguments in the public domain. We're going to be doing in-depth research. We're going to need help and ammunition for our media advocacy. Uh, we need to provide resources for our very important title deed transfer program, Kai Alum, that we mm -hmm. spoke about. And we also need resources to engage in public interest litigation. And actually, uh, our rule of law project was a key applicant. We were an amicus in the Sarkilika case uh, against the, the National Treasury, against the Minister of Finance, around race-based uh, preferential procurement policy and the uh, pre-qualification criteria. So our arguments were v critical in swaying the Constitutional Court to rule against race-based uh, criteria in procurement, which has unlocked potentially billions of rands worth of private enterprise companies doing business with the state. So that's an example of how our litigation really matters and, and works. So all of these various activities require financial support. And at the moment, we're running our one million rand challenge. So we have a very generous uh, anonymous donor. A benefactor. Benefactor who's agreed to match any new donations that come into the FMF by 50%. So if you donate a thousand rand to the it's SMF, 1500. then you get, then we get 1500. And by the way, that donation is tax deductible. We'll issue you with a section 18A mm -hmm. certificate so you can claim that back. Is that to build, to build a war chest to, to pursue the policies you're yeah. trying to achieve? Okay. So we, uh, 
you know, have overheads and expenses that of we course. need to meet. We're pretty frugal. You've got to pay for electricity. <laughs> yeah. Your rates are going up. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, so our lease agreement ties us into a, a diesel generator. Oh, uh, you got to pay for the diesel. Yeah, which is costing us 20000 rand a month. <laughs> how, how about that? So Talk uh, about any fish. I think it's time for us to maybe explore some alternative uh, <sighs> solutions there. But some gerbils on wheels. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, we need to practice what we preach and seek efficiencies uh, there you go. from the market. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, you know, I think that that's, th and that challenge runs up until the end of this month. So if you donate. Oh, there the you go, folks. Weeks, you got to the end of uh, February to do that. Yeah. And where, where do they find that? They go on the website? Or? Yeah, so freemarketfoundation.com. You'll see a big banner there. Oh, not .co.za, .com. No, .com, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but, you know, that it, our obligation to South Africans who support us is to continue to not only promote these very important freedoms, but also to defend them as well. Excellent. And, you know, I think that that, if you think of the metaphor of a shield and a spear, right? So the promotion is, is the spear, the shield is the defense. Well, there you go, folks. Um, that's a pretty good summary of what uh, the Free Market Foundation is all about. Not all their activities. I think in the future, I'd like to probably do a, a, a broadcast just on the Kai Lama program. That sounds very mm -hmm. fascinating. But David Ansar, it's been a real pleasure. Bye bye, donkey. K Alibo, thank you so much for your time. Do appreciate it. I hope, folks, that you got something useful out of this. I know I did. I learned an awful lot. And uh, I look at every day as a learning opportunity. I hope you do the same. So we're still live. I'm going to go shut it down. So you're still on camera, David. So don't, don't do anything to embarrass so yourself. Your mic there. is hot, eh? Yeah, your mic is still hot, and so is mine. Don't do anything to embarrass yourself until <laughs> I shut down. Because we don't have an assistant here. So well, my, my audience knows how this goes. We do run these uh, title deed handover ceremonies in the Free State and the Western Cape. So if you're ever uh, around for one of those, we'll happily invite you. Okay, that sounds like a good deal. Okay.